Hi, I'm Adrian Kennard and I have an ASR33 Teletype and it is a marvellous feat of engineering. It's as old as me and we've got it working. Now I'm not going to show you one of these restoration videos, there are lots of those, but this video is just to run through how it actually works. It is quite unbelievable. Hope you enjoy it. This is the actual teletype. The case is something of a state. We're still working on it. I need to sort the buttons here, but it does work. Okay, let's look at it with the lid off. Okay, you can see that it's got lots of parts to it. There's a keyboard, a print unit here, a paper tape punch, a paper tape reader, some electronics here. In the back there's a power supply. We'll start with the keyboard. So we have a fairly conventional keyboard, although it is only uppercase and it does have some oddities like a crossed O and uncrossed zero. This is something IBM used in the early days and it also rather dates this keyboard. We think this teletype dates from 1963 or 1964, which makes it about the same age as me. A little bit scary. The whole of the keyboard is in fact a separate module, screwed down, and it has a mechanical linkage at the back here. This H bar in here links the mechanism of the keyboard to the back of the teletype. Now what's really amazing here is the keyboard is entirely mechanical. It has no electronics as such in it at all. When I press a key, it forces a pattern on here. And this is done by a load of bars here, and they actually work in pairs, so they're, they're sort of in parallel, and they do that or that. And all of the keys have a bar this way with encoded notches. So when you press a key, it forces a particular pattern of ups and downs on eight bars that go across here. So for example, if I press an A, you have this pattern. I can manually reset it and press a, an O, and I get a different pattern, or G. The pattern is actually an 8-bit code for the key. There's some extra bars to do clever stuff with Control and Shift, which slightly change the pattern. But at the end of the day, that keyboard is entirely mechanical. The key combinations provide all of the letters, numbers, symbols. As I said, shift and control can make a variation. And it's actually an even parity keyboard. The, the notches in here create the correct 8-bit pattern for even parity. There are a couple of extra special keys. There's a repeat key, which defeats the catch mechanism. When you've pressed a key, I can't press another key. When you've pressed a key, what did I press? G. When you've pressed a key, you can't press another key. It's locked out. And there's a mechanical mechanism that's in here which releases that and allows you to press another key. The repeat key defeats that, letting you hold repeat and the key to continuously press a key. There's also a break key here, which actually does something really simple. It actually pushes this lever out, which moves this wire. There's a metal contact bar here and a wire here, which is what all of these do. But this one disconnects this wire. It literally breaks the circuit, so it's no longer connected. There is also a here is key, which works a lever, the only other mechanical linkage, which operates the answer back. The answer back is a mechanical drum, which sends a sequence of up to 20 characters, pre-programmed by breaking little tabs off the drum, so as to send the identity of the machine. Now at this point I need to move some of this electrics out of the way. And what you see here is called a distributor. It has the eight contacts from the keyboard around the outside, a centre and these two carbon brushes. So when it spins round it does a start bit, eight data bits and two stop bits. And it's literally connecting to each of the, the wires on the side of the keyboard, one in turn, as it goes round. And the way this works is a mechanical linkage in here from the keyboard trips a clutch which allows it to spin round once. I'll show you it working. As you can see it's quite noisy. If I use the repeat key, what we have is a simple electrical circuit. 
it comes in from the back, goes through the common on the keyboard, through that brake connection, which isn't normally broken, into a connector bar at the back of those eight sprung wires, a combination of which is set by key. Those then go to the distributor, which connects to each in turn. So you have a circuit that's normally closed and it opens for the start bit and then closes and opens in a pattern for the eight ba data bits as you send out the byte. It happens 10 revolutions a second. There are 11 bits, a start, eight data and two stop. So that's 110 board. And that is how it sends data. It is completely mechanical. There's no electronics at all. There's just these contact wires and contact brushes running off a motor. Now I mentioned the motor. This is the key workhorse for the entire system. It runs off the main power supply, runs continuously. This is a 50 hertz version, which does 10 revolutions a second. And it has some gearing and it has one of these trippable clutches. So the mechanical linkage from the keyboard trips this clutch in here, causing it to engage. And as it goes round, there are cams at the back here, which cause it to disengage at the end of that one cycle, sending one byte. There's also a trippable clutch the other side. And this is where we come into receiving data. You can see how completely mechanically data is sent. But how do we receive data mechanically? Well, there's a little bit more to it, but not a lot. A good start is looking at what this data looks like. This is what gets sent out from the machine. So how do we clock that back in? Well, the first bit is this card here with a transistor and various components. The data comes in as 20 milliamp current, which strips this resistor, which strips this power resistor on a heatsink here, all of which works this solenoid here. Now this solenoid is holding this down at the moment. When we get a start bit, this little get lever goes up, which trips this clutch and allows it to spin round. There are then these cams in here, all slightly offset at different points in the cycle. And the solenoid goes on and off as it goes through that data. And each of these cams cause the solenoid to engage to latch one of eight bars that go across here. Those bars are then linked to bars that go right across the print head and also into the punch tape. And you can see those eight bars that go across in here. And the data is mechanically clocked in. And when I say mechanically clocked in, that solenoid is the only electrical component in the whole process. It's possible, if you wanted to, with the machine completely powered off, to turn the motor manually, release the solenoid, clock in a start bit, and as you go round, you hear a little click as it goes through each, each of those cams, you can move the solenoid to clock in data. You keep turning that motor, and it will actually print the character you've manually clocked in. The whole process of receiving and printing is done mechanically from that one solenoid that moves up to 110 times per second. These bars at the back here, there's actually nine. There's eight bars for the data and one bar's an inhibit bit, I believe. These are set based on the data that was clocked in here. And there's little levers that push up to control the print head. Now, two of the bits work little catches that slot in that control how high this head can go up. The head actually has 64 characters on it, so it can go into four positions up. There's also three of these control how far round it goes, up to eight positions, and one of them controls whether it goes left or right. There's literally two levers, and it either pushes this lever to go right or this lever to go left. And it hits end stops, and those end stops are based on those three bits that cause it to stop at the right point to get the right character. So that gives us 64 characters. There's also bars that go under the eight bars. These catch with a particular pattern, a bit like the keyboard. So they're function bars. So there's one that catches at just the right combination for a bell and causes a bell at the back to ding. There's one for carriage return. And there's one for line feed. Now I mentioned the paper tape punch. These rods stick out and operate the punch based on the eight bits that are fed 
and there's a release here and there's a back step here and there's on and off so this is the paper tape punch it literally feeds paper through like that There's also a paper tape reader. This has little wires. The eight wires on the paper tape reader make contact in just the same way as the keyboard and they're wired in parallel into that distributor. So when you put tape to the reader, it's just like you're typing it on the keyboard. And finally, this is the answer back mechanism. There's a drum here with little tabs that you break off. If I press that here is button, a mechanical linkage causes it to whiz round and send 20 characters of text, exactly the same as if they were typed on the keyboard. These wires make contact with the contact bar in the same way. The whole lot is then controlled by an ESP32 microcontroller with literally a 100 ohm resistor being used to drive the 20 milliamp current loop. That's how an ASR33 teletype actually works. It really is an amazing mechanical marvel. I do wonder what it would be like to replace all of that huge amount of electronics with something modern. I suspect we're talking about a tiny little power regulator and a tiny little solid state chip to control the uh, selector solenoid. And that's all you'd need. It probably replaced the whole of that end section with a circuit board the size of a postage stamp. Thank you for watching. I hope you found that quite as amazing as I found it when I was working on it. It really is quite incredible. So there you have one ASR33 teletype as old as me.